T-A-I-C-H-I, that's T-A-I-C-H-I, alleviates chronic lower back pain. That's good news. Think of all the people taking non steroidal anti-inflammatories like aspirin, ibuprofen, or even more, let's say, risky ones like opiates to relieve pain when this could do it. Also today, I'm going to be sharing some insights, as I promised the other day, about what can we do to become more conscious of our health and help save the environment simultaneously. That's good, and uh, we're going to do both because I'm going to begin a series on becoming a healthy vegan, and saving the planet, and sustaining your health. And please download this and start sharing this with people who may also be interested in this topic. Also today, I'll be taking a look at some other issues, including a video on the tax collectors are threatening not just to take away a people's home, but also to put them in jail. Then we have an interesting discussion on biofabrication. That is the next Industrial Revolution from Suzanne Lee. What is biofabrication? Using bacteria, fungi, to build things stronger, better, quicker than we could if we, let's say, made cotton. We can now use biofabricated fabric. It's actually been done. Yes, there are dresses and suits and pants and shirts not made from silk or satin, or cotton, or wool? No, made from bacteria, and you would never know it. The difference is the bacteria can grow that amount of material in about 24 hours. Whoa, new information, and again, always, always looking for ways to improve the quality of our lives and the environment. But we begin with the latest on health and healing. A new study evaluated the feasibility and acceptability of using Tai Chi to improve chronic low back pain, and especially in older adults, and they found that it really did work. Now, if you've ever seen people doing Tai Chi, you know it's very slow, it's very methodical, and it is a meditation, but it's also originally a martial arts, but people don't use it for the martial arts. They use it for limbering, stretching, and strengthening, but it also has the capacity to turn off pain, especially in the lower back. And this was a randomized trial for 12 weeks using Tai Chi every day versus those who did not. 70% improvement, 70%, wow, that's terrific. From the University of McCall, they say that quercetin, in this study, is neuroprotective. Quercetin, Q-U-E-R-C-E-T-I-N, quercetin, three syllables, easy. An onion, quercetin, an apple, the skin, quercetin. Or take a quercetin tablet. The amount that I take, I have to take the vegan capsules, but it, as much vitamin C as I take, I take half again as much um, so if I take 1,000 milligrams of vitamin C, at a time I'll take 500 milligrams of quercetin. And I always take quercetin with vitamin C. So this can help prevent dementia. Now mind you, dementia is the major condition, but Alzheimer's is one of the conditions of dementia. So if you want to help protect your neurons, protect your memory, protect your cognition, take your quercetin, a natural flavonoid, and you're going to get it in a lot of different different uh, fruits and vegetables, but not in high amounts. Onions, yes. That's why I always say a raw onion in a day, a sweet onion, can help prevent a stroke that day because it thins the blood. It's also antibacterial. Also, for those of you using honey, something I've been advocating my entire career because I had a great aunt who had her own apothecary. She was just one of those wonderful human beings that nobody seemed to like to be around because she was a strong disciplinarian, a little wiry woman. She was a vegetarian, and she ran this farm that she had lived on 
uh, over in Little Hawking, Ohio, right across the river from Parkersburg, where I grew up. And during the Great Depression, a lot of my family lived there, worked there. And uh, I remember being told that she had a barn that was immaculately clean and everything was perfect on her farm, according to the, the people who lived there who were my family. But she had everyone up at 4 o'clock in the morning and then preparing food for the hobos that would stop on the trains, at least the trains that were kind enough to stop to allow them to get off for three minutes. That's all they had, so they didn't miss their schedule. And there would be a little table set up, and whatever they had, they would give half of everything they had to these strangers that they would never see again. And uh, if they made bread, they were making bread. They would give them bread, or they would make sandwiches. And But they also had honey. They had lots of beehives. <clears throat> so they would sometimes start to come down with a sore throat, which is normal when you're working on a farm. You're around hay and you're around animal danders, so it's not uncommon. It's not an allergen. And they would, she would give uh, raw honey. She had it in big barrels, I was told. And then she had this one big black barrel, and in it was just this kind of gooey stuff that looked like thick motor oil. That's bee propolis. That's one of the most perfect things in the world to take, even to pack into a wound, is bee propolis. So I'm a big believer in using honey. I have honey right here on my desk, and uh, I'll give it you know, to friends if there's a scratch, a cut, Pack it in with that uh, raw honey. Now, Manuka honey is one of the most powerful known honeys in the world, but there are a lot of other honeys that are also good. And electronic databases for studies involving the use of honey alone, optimism, had lower inflammation. And inflammation is what can lead to stroke and reduce stroke severity and less physical disability after three months compared to those who are less optimistic. And that was from the Nursing Symposium of the American Stroke Association's International Stroke Conference, just given uh, this week. So these are the best experts in the world, clinicians on stroke and the science of it. So how about that? Optimism, being positive, being really positive makes a difference. I just answered um, someone I know's email this morning. They're very non-optimistic, fatalistic, apocalyptic about themselves and the future. And the reason is because they have not lived a life based upon the principles of optimism, but rather the allure of it. What do I mean? I mean it's one thing to get caught up in the new agey, touchy-feely, everything's going to work out, everything's just the way it should be, which is nonsense. Nothing's going to work out. Nothing is the way it should have been. <clears throat> All this is based upon cause and effect, and whether or not we willingly examine the underlying cause, the real underlying cause of our dystopian world, and see why do we have conflicts, why do we have starvation, why do we have hunger, why do we have poverty, why do we have in in income inequality, why do we have these things that are never being addressed? Well, more often than not, it's because we're not optimistic. And if you're not optimistic, then you maladapt to what is opportunistic. And in opportunism, frequently, not always, is associated with a passive-aggressive behavior. So you'll be smiling on the outside, but looking for how you can angle something on the inside. You're looking always for the angle. But you say the words, and everyone today knows the words, just listen to any politician, listen to Barack Obama, go back and listen to his speeches. You'd have thought there will be a totally different place for the better, and he was probably the most destructive president of any president in American history. And that's because he was charming. People believed him. People wanted to believe in him, especially people of minority. And boy, did he do a number on them. And if you doubt me, remember the people in Libya are people of color. In Syria. In the Sudan. And go ask about how's their life today based upon Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama. We don't expect anything ever spiritual or humanistic out of Clinton. That would not be possible. But we do out of Obama. So selling optimism is a whole cottage industry. Tony Robbins and 
Wayne Dyer and all these people, but how many people actually changed? Changing your vocabulary does not change the underlining acceptance that we're not going to do what we say we were going to do. We're not going to have the discipline that we promise ourselves at some point, maybe January 1st each year we will do. But if you engage optimism, not as euphemism, but as a practical way of living, then every single day you can look at that day with all of its crisis, with all of its problems, more optimistically. Just having an optimistic mind means you're going to look for solutions rather than enable yourself with other people who are engaged in negative groupthink, cynicism, bitterness, hubris. So this study showed that. Good for them. Good study, University of Texas, and good for the nursing symposium at the American Stroke Association's International Stroke Conference to share this, because that's not in any textbook. <clears throat> so post-stroke inflammation is very detrimental to your brain. It impairs recovery. Optimism lowers inflammation levels because it lowers your cortisol levels, epinephrine levels, catecholamine levels, adrenaline levels. And that gives you a healthier outcome. So that should apply to all conditions, not just stroke. I'm working with someone who has end-stage cancer. Nothing more medically can be done. And yet, without me knowing it, the person was continuing to take their chemotherapy. Didn't know it. And I said, why? And the answer is, well, you know, I mean, where I come from, but well, where you come from? You're a highly educated person with a doctorate and successful. So you're coming from a very linear left brain position, and that's going to cure you? Well, that's the very condition that got you in this problem. And how did it work with all these top oncologists, the top cancer centers. How did that work? If it worked, you wouldn't be asking for help. It didn't. That's the fear people have. I want to keep what I've been conditioned to believe is right. I want to keep it. I've got to keep it. But what do you have that's alternative? I'll, I'll combine the two. That's it. That has never worked once in my career. If you're going to engage in something, engage in, if you're going to do chemotherapy, do it with optimism. If you're going to do alternative, do alternative. If you think you're going to do the two that's going to work for you, it doesn't. Because one is killing cells, destroying the immune system, and you're going to feel the effect. And guess how I found out? Only when all the effects of the chemotherapy were so manifest, the person couldn't function, couldn't drive, couldn't walk, swollen legs, swollen feet, uh, chronic diarrhea. And that's when the truth came out. Now, guess what? Three weeks later, everything is healthy. Three weeks of just doing the right thing instead of trying to do the conditioned thing. That applies to everything else in life, by the way. <clears throat> well, I'm going to be honest, until I don't have to be. I'm going to be happy until I don't have to be. I'm going to be positive until I don't have to be. Well, why do you have to be any of the negatives? That's a conditioned response. That's what we're not dealing with. That's the deeper underlying psychopathological conditioning that we are all influenced by, some more than others, and that's our job no longer to blame our mother who didn't breastfeed us enough or we weren't loved as a child, boo-hoo, boo-hoo, to all the people who say, well, I wasn't given the parenting. Yeah? And how many of us were given all the perfect? There was no perfect parent. There's never been a perfect parent unless you're a dog or a cat or a lioness. Yeah, then you're an elephant. There's your perfect parent. In humans, never. They do the best they can or they don't care how well they do as long as they provide the basics. So one day you realize, my God, I've been acting out, overcompensating, I've been associating with wrong people, doing the wrong things, having the wrong relationships, not taking the right chances, taking the wrong opportunities, always in a dead end, and ending up living a life of chronic, constant crisis and drama. Now, you want to know who's never going to be happy, never going to have a fulfilled moment, never going to see the light of true, authentic living? The person who tells you, ah, oh, damn, I'd like to work on my help, but... 
I got this crisis. I get this drama. I'm, I'm, t- I'm a responsible bullshit. You're phony. Your crisis, your drama, that's you're intending to live through your crisis and drama. You show some, me someone who shows you the merit badges of their suffering, and I'll show you a person who put those merit badges on and hermetically sealed them to their psyche. Try to help someone like that. They'll be in therapy the rest of their life, and they'll pride themselves on how much they suffer and how much their therapist guides them, none of which is going to do anyone any damn good. But we don't have that conversation, do we? Because we have an industry of people who are enabling people by helping them. Yeah. I had a conversation once with six of my friends. We were all having dinner together. I said, you're all board-certified psychiatrists and psychologists. How many people have you actually cured? And they laughed. None. I said, well, don't you feel then that you're misleading people by taking their money, seeing them two or three times a week? I'm listening to you all trading patients. Oh, I've had this patient 12 years. So I'll give you a delusional psychotic and you give me your manic depressive. They were actually doing this at dinner. Like it was a, oh, okay, I've gotten as much juice out of that orange. Now, now it's your turn. What frauds? None of it humanistic. That will help people. In any case, just understand, the moment someone keeps telling you their story about how they've been a victim, that's a person that needs to stay in the mindset of enabling victimization. There's no optimism with that person. And therefore, the consequences of not being optimistic. You be optimistic, and you're already on your road to recovery. But that's not in the curriculum. That's not taught in school. Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, Eagle Scouts, Cub Scouts, uh, or the era, that they taught. And some parents were wise enough to teach that to their children and insist upon it. Don't look at everything as down. Start looking how you get up. This whole stupid culture and a whole generation of entitled, pampered, coddled kids don't believe in optimism. They don't see that. And that's unfortunate. They deserve better. From the University of Petro in Sao Paulo in Brazil comes a good story on, on the pulp of ACI. It improves antioxidant defense and protects your arteries. This was published in Clinical Nutrition. That's good news. In fact, in 40 female participants, four weeks, if you used it on a daily basis, you had an 18% greater antioxidant capacity and your arteries are rejuvenating. That is good for your heart and your arteries and your epithelium. So use it on a daily basis. And postmenopausal women had a vitamin D deficiency, and that led to disc degeneration and lower back pain. This is a brand new study from the North American Menopause Society. So get your vitamin D, 2,000 units a day, all right? And that can help. And finally, sitting still linked to increased risk of depression in younger people. University College of London, published in The Lancet, Psychiatry, simply stated, too much time sitting, that means an hour to, or more time, which is sedentary behavior, is linked to a substantial increase in the risk of depressive symptoms. So let's get our kids out. Let's get them yell, yelling, screaming, fighting, running, pulling hair, all the things kids did too. <laughs> And stop being a micromanaging helicopter parent of dysfunctional nature. Yeah. If you want to micromanage a kid's life from the time they're born, before they're born, until they're 39, then the next time have a rectal birth because you're going to have the same outcome. I'm Gary Knoll. That's the latest on health and healing. We're going to be back in a moment to talk about veganism. Only a small percentage of the American population are vegans. Let's hope that we can inspire more. Please stay with us.
I'd like to welcome everyone. I'm Gary Knoll. Starting today and for the next hundred days, more or less, I'm going to be playing a little different music. I normally play soul music, rhythm, blues, gospel, but I want to honor the other people in the audience who have some favorite type of music uh, from the last, let's say from the 1960s, 70s, and 80s. So I've selected new music. So just want to let you know it's coming at you. And to save the planet and sustain your health, become a vegan. That's this article. It'll be on PRN.fm. Please download it. This past Sunday evening, the Academy Award recipient, Jochen Phoenix, gave an extraordinary speech. He spoke about his personal dark side he had struggled with in the past and how the movie industry and his peers in cinema gave him a second chance. It was an affirmation of redemption. For those of us in the vegan movement, Phoenix's speech was heartwarming and emblemic of the kind of revelations that emerge when a person realizes the violence from which their meat in a meal originates. It is food from a living, sentient being. He gave the image of a mother cow giving birth to an infant calf and the mother crying for days as her calf was taken away. Other celebrities, either in attendance or absent, have already reached this realization, such as Natalie Portman and, and Peter Dinklage and Michelle Pfeiffer and Woody Harrelson to director James Cameron, Daryl Hannah, who I have a lot of respect for, Paul McCartney, another good one, and now Sylvester, excuse me, not Sylvester Stallone, but Arnold Schwarzenegger. Today, the science is clear. Let's get that out of the way. I have all of the scientific literature in the world in my database with over a thousand plus studies. When you go healthy, vegan, plant-based, the peer-reviewed literature supports that this will, including a Mediterranean diet, will relieve and even help you treat disease, cancers included, on the other side of the equation, I look for the opposite. How many studies in the peer-reviewed literature actually support that you're healthier because of eating meat? How about none? In fact, hundreds of studies show that a meat-based diet is an unhealthy diet and leads to disease, including cancers, heart disease, diabetes, obesity, and inflammation, such as arthritis. If we focus solely upon healthy issues, living a healthier life, making healthier decisions, then disease and premature death are on the side of a meat-based diet. Virtually all the commercials you see are promoting death and disease. That's not just my opinion, that's the actual scientific literature. So wouldn't you think that we would begin to awaken to this? But we don't. Some people care more about the environment than they do about themselves. Consequently, their concerns about the largesse of the meat industry, the gifts they've given us, is that it's energy intensive and therefore let's not eat meat to save energy. Good. The water necessary to grow a plot of potatoes compared to a hamburger is astronomical. Weaning ourselves off meat reduces global warming because the billions of animals, up to 80 billion a year, are raised for human consumption, and that increases greenhouse gas emissions, notably methane. And now, of all the fishing done in the world, and the number one fisheries are from China, 50% or more of all fish are fed to cattle. And that's just foolish. If you do not feel this is a particularly important element, then consider the frightening event of Antarctica reaching 67 degrees just a few days ago, the hottest ever recorded in Antarctica. For the past three years, the southern continent has had the highest temperatures ever recorded. Therefore, every bite you take counts. There is also today a growing movement to purchase organic, plant-based food that is raised locally. This is in part because there is a highly educated class of millennials and X generation who realize the importance of a healthy diet for sustaining a healthy body. 
But what is perhaps equally important is to investigate and understand where our information for making wise choices comes from. Who inspires us to seek the truth? And that is where, why Phoenix's speech was so necessary at this time. Do I personally believe that the majority of people watching him from that auditorium are going to change? No. No, they left there to go to the parties, the vanity party, to eat the crappy food, to drink the alcohol, to brag about themselves, to cry about themselves, to feel sorry for themselves, and to have their hangers-on retainers, their agents, their, their yes people all say, poor, poor you, next year, yes, we'll make it happen. They could have gone out and found a homeless person and bought them a room for a month so the person would be on the streets, taken them to a clothing store and bought them some clothes, taken them to a drugstore and bought them toiletries. But no, that would have actually shown that these people who I don't like, and I make no bones about it, and I've counseled many of them, remember, never confuse something. The fact that I may help save your life doesn't mean I like you. There are a lot of people I've saved their lives are unlikable. They're just nasty people. And so I'm talking about Phoenix. I wouldn't have helped because I didn't like him. He was a nasty, and he acknowledged that. That takes courage, and I respect that. But everyone in there was just posturing like, oh, we'll applaud you because we want to be shown on the camera that we're applauding you. Well, are you going to change? No, that's the reality. Throughout our lives, we have two principal kinds of mentors who guide us. First, there are the policymakers. These are, at the beginning, our parents. They make the policies of what is right and wrong and how we should live when we're young. And then school teachers, when we go to school, what we're learning, how we should learn, how we should apply it, how we become critical thinking. These are policies. And then when we enter society, there are the captains of industry, whether it's a CEO of a telecommunications company, such as Verizon, telling us we need 5G to be hip, to be on top of it, to be connected to everything Internet. Or it might be, let's say, a, uh, a policymaker on creating the television programs we watch, as if we all need, we really need to see the Cardassians, the most vacuous group of people, in history. I don't believe they're actually alive. I believe they were genetically engineered in, in someone's laboratory and they began to goof on people once they realized they can make a completely vacuous person that could not ever have a stroke because they have no brain in their heart, had and no heart to have a heart attack. What dreck? All because she made a porn film and allegedly her mother promoted that and so we take someone who did a porn film, is self-serving, and now is a billionaire and her sister's billionaire. The whole family's a billionaire. Why not make him a trillionaire? Why, why not make him the most important people in the world? Because they show up everywhere, like everybody wants a Cardassian. <clears throat> no, the only place that Cardassians deserve to be seen is if they put on the orange coats and work on a sanitation truck. That is where they deserve, in my opinion, but that's just me. What do I know about this? So here we have these people actually influencing us. I was just speaking with someone this morning. And this person was telling me, because they needed some help with their dog who has a seizure, so I was helping them with their, create a protocol to turn off the seizures in their dog, get their dog back to health. And they said about how unfortunate it is that a whole generation of young girls are using the Cardassians as an example. And what it's doing to their body, she said, you know, I know young girls who at age 17 are coming in and get their lips, you know, fuller, or getting surgery to get their derriere larger. And she said they have no idea what they're going to look like in 10 years and how unhealthy this is. I said, it's not that that in itself is unhealthy. It's the fact that the people who are influencing them, and those are not policymakers, those are opinion leaders. Remember, corporate entities establish and often write policies. They write the laws. From the policy makers, information trickles down through think tanks, foundations, public relations firms, lobbyists, and politicians, consultants. And the media is their primary echo chamber. So everything you see in the media, it's not of their own creation. It is what they're told. The second mentor are opinion leaders. Now, these are the people who are in the public eye, and they generate large followings. 
average people look to them as role models and examples of what they assume is appropriate behavior. These are the people who are thought to be in the know, kind of ahead of the curve, real hip, drive futuristic trends. Sometimes they work endlessly, such as basketball star LeBron James, to inspire thousands of kids. Good for him. But he's also, you know, he's controlled by Nike. Who pays the check to all these athletes? Nike. The Nike has control. Do they go to Nike and say, before I can accept this check, I want you to take me to the factory where people are working. I want to see that they have good working conditions, are paid a fair wage, have environment that is clean, and that they're, they're, they're given humanitarian care as we would if we were working a job on Wall Street. I can't take your money until I see that. Oh, Colin Kaepernick? Yeah. Are you also taking a knee for the people who are working to make the money that you got from Nike? Or is that not part of the wokeness? Wow. So motivational speakers in politics, sports, entertainment, corporate culture, the media, these are the people who have been acknowledged for their success in motivating other people. Rush Limbaugh, who's made more racist statements and stupid statements than anyone I know of in the media, yet he's given an award. For what? <clears throat> Being a popular conservative? Or Rush, Rachel Maddow, the same. So follow the person back and see if there's any motivation other than just the idea that they want to share something with you and you have a right to say yes or no to. And then check to see the money that comes in and who motivates them. So when we think of a famous person as an opinion leader who becomes a vegan, there will be a sizable number of people who will follow their advice and example. The largest increase in vegan movement occurs when a person who people admire acts by example and explains why it's so important to stop the suffering of animals. Bravo to Phoenix. Let us hope that others in the audience and viewers will come forward to join the effort. Remember, it only takes 3.5% of the population to support in unison a given cause in order to change the course of policymakers. But here's what you should also know. Let's just be very pragmatic. Yes, a vegan diet can be incredibly delicious, and cost-effective plant-based diets could reduce your risk of all cancers by 50%, decrease your chance of developing diabetes by 50%, eliminate type 2 diabetes by 90%, drop your chance of developing heart disease by 24%, reduce your chance of dying from heart disease by 29%, or having heart disease reduce a future cardiac events by 73%. If you've had a heart attack or stroke, it reduces by 73%. Lower your risk of colon cancer by 40%. Have an 80% chance of reducing arthritis symptoms in less than four weeks. We've done it. I'm the one who did the study, the first ever. 28 days, people who had been with arthritis for a minimum of seven years on medications within 28 days off all medications, stiffness gone. In fact, on the very last night, we filmed it. In fact, <clears throat> Jesse asked Val to find the clip of the last night of the anti-arthritis study group. We did it over at the Tri-State, uh, no, we did it over at the um, uh, anti-aging 92nd Street studio. It was the last thing we did over there. And I want to compare the first day when they came, talking about their illness and, and their stiffness, and they couldn't move, and they're in pain, they're on these medications, and the 28 days later, and there's one guy who said that he hadn't been able to move his hands, his fingers, in 27 years. And then he stood up to the camera and he showed us all the movement and flexibility in his hand. It was normal with no pain. And the guy who said that the first time he didn't think he'd be able to come back because there was a hill coming down 92nd Street and he had to walk down the hill. And with a cane, it took him 45 minutes to walk two blocks down that hill. Two blocks. And the last night, he bounded down the hill, he said, running, and ran up the steps. Let's get that ready for tomorrow. I want people to see before and after 28 days that no publicity ever got done on that study. But that's the result. So that was also with a plant-based diet, because that was the protocol. 
significantly lowering your blood pressure, significantly lowering your cholesterol levels, doubling the number of natural killer cells in your body, therefore increasing the strength of your immune system, especially against cancer, significantly lessening your likelihood of being obese. Let's get a clip. Sharon would have a clip and Valerie would have the clip of Fred from Brooklyn. I got the call. He could barely talk. He said he had to go in for surgery within a week or he was going to die. And he wanted to know, was there any help? I said, there's always help. And he said, but I'm 727 pounds. I've got congestive heart failure. I'm 55 years of age. And the doctor said, if I have the surgery, I'm probably going to die. And if I don't have the surgery, I'm absolutely going to die. I don't know what to do. And a year later, I stood in Detroit in PBS station and I held up his, I'm six foot one, and I held his belt and the belt from the floor was above my head. That's how big his waist was. And here he had lost 345 pounds, no longer had congestive heart failure, arthritis, the depression, and he would help thousands of people over the next 20 years because people came to see Fred on his steps in Brooklyn and he became just a major advocate of health. And let's see if we can't show people. I'd like to show these. <clears throat> it also, you have leaner, healthier children. You improve your sleep. Your sex life improves. And your complexion improves. It gives you more energy than you've had ever before. And more importantly, it adds years to your life. So in addition, despite the lack of action in the United States, there are nations and major cities around the world taking climate change seriously, and visionaries and scientists are creating unique and wonderful innovations in renewable energy to challenge America's hubris and denial and complacency. And rather than descending into apathy and withdrawing into isolation and being unwilling to face these problems, we might consider optimistic strategies for how we can individually and collectively make a difference. And we can. And the foremost effort each of us can begin at this very moment is to adopt healthy plant-based diets. Not only is it affordable, but a vegan lifestyle will also strengthen our physical and mental health to face the challenges ahead. In fact, right now, as we speak today, a delivery of the hydroponic system, where we're going to build a hydroponic, photograph it, so you can do one in your own backyard. We're doing one, it's being headed by one of the people in this audience, <clears throat> where they're showing how to grow food from microgreens to sprouts to medicinal herbs to culinary herbs so you can go out every day and just pick your lunch and dinner. How about that? And it's inexpensive. So what if I told you that in one year of eating this way, you would save the lives, you personally would save the lives of 400 animals, plus you would save 300,000 gallons of water, 90,000 pounds of grain and more than 7,000 or 5,700 gallons of gasoline, all while generating 50% fewer carbon emissions. You would also end your contribution through dietary choices to depleting rainforest, eroding topsoil, world hunger, and global warming, while standing for cleaner air, cleaner water, and aquifers, rivers and lakes and oceans, cleaner drinking water, the humane treatment of animals and humans, and the health of any number a species in the planet. Would you want to hear about it? Moreover, would you be interested in knowing that millions and a growing number of people in our country and around the world are choosing this diet and lifestyle and attitude and optimism? It's true. Share this information with others. The article, Saving the Planet and Sustaining Your Health Becoming a veg Vegan is posted on uh, PRN.FM. Now, we're going to take a break and come right back at you, so please stay with us.
I'm Gary Nall, broadcasting all over the world and stations around the country. We welcome you. It's Valentine's Day is coming up. That's a time when, if you can, find the people in your life and share your unconditional love and joy and passion and pleasure with. It's a time to remember those people who are there for us, take them never for granted, and we all can do that if we slow down long enough to realize what our real priorities should be. I've got something for you. I've got two things for you today. The first is a Valentine special. And uh, here's the Valentine special. And by the way, it would normally cost you $164. It's only $88. This is for the men in our audience because I've got, I've got and plus for the women, a five CD set on sexual fulfillment. Uh, CD1, an integral body, mind, spirit approach to sexuality, and then uh, Gina Ogden, a doctor, uh, therapist, uh, and relationships, sexuality, spiritual series. Got some of the world's greatest experts in this series. A whole lot of good people. Uh, Diane Wiley is there. And uh, anyhow, it's a uh, uh, B.D. Cohan is there. So this is a great series. Plus, there's a DVD uh, on love. Just the whole DVD is on love. And for those of you who were there when I filmed this, uh, it was on the east side. We had 150 people in the audience. It was standing room only. Well, I did my lecture. Then I filmed other people that I respect around the world. Uh, we filmed uh, Dr. Christopher Corman and uh, Dr. Ashcock Gangadeen and Dr. Amit Goswami and Dr. Henry Grayson and Dr. Joyce Hawks and Dr. Erwin Laszlo and Rabbi Michael Lerner and Dr. Bruce Lipton and Luann Panessi and Susan McD McNeil and Dr. Judith Orloff and Dr. Peter Resnick. God, he is brilliant, Peter Resnick, one of the smartest guys I've ever met in my life. Uh, Dr. Elizabeth Schmidt and Dr. Uh, Harold Shinsky and Dr. Stuart Savinsky. And Dr. Robert Thurman, one of the nicest human beings you'll ever meet, is Robert Thurman. I know Robert for a long time. He's the father of Uma Thurman. And he and I uh, uh, together went up to Gerald Solante's uh, introduction of Occupy Peace and Prosperity in Kingston. 1,400 of you showed up. I want to thank you for showing up and supporting that. Anyhow, these are all in this love documentary. It's a long documentary, but boy, is it. And I was taking questions from the audience at the same time. So it's a wonderful, very positive, very upbeat, but very deep and insightful way to understand love, what it is and what it is not, not to confuse need with love and emotional insecurity with whoever's in our life at that moment. We love them. No, frequently we don't. We need them. And so we go into great depth about what love is and isn't and how we can be love not just fall in love or out of love, but be love. So that's part of this. Then the five CD set on sexual fulfillment. And then finally, for the men in the audience, rock hard. Yeah, it's herbal supplement. What's in it? Well, yohembe bark, oat straw, saw palmetto berries, um, epimedium herb, ginkgo biloba, ginger, luther, root, Muira puama root, Lycinium berries, fresh ashwagandha root, velvet bean seed, anise seed, cardamom seed, cinnamon bark, yeah, and deionized water. And I, when I, boy, it takes a long time. I think it takes six months to make this. We have to first get herbs in from all over the world, and then it has to be in a lab where there's botan botanists and PhDs and this. They analyze to make sure if I order the leaf, the leaf is there in the stem the twig, whatever it is, and they make sure it's authentic. If it's not, it's sent back. And you ought to see these herbs. They come in in these big bells looking about the size of a car. And uh, then they have to be cleaned and then quarantined. And then they're put into this this distillation tank, and it's a big tank. It's, you could put probably two cars in this tank. And then over a long period of time, the essential oils come out of these, and then the oils are tested for purity and potency, and that is what you get. How about that? Rock hard. It works. I'm not going to tell you what it works for, but I'll just say it works. And uh, it's one of my most 
for men, it's for years, one of my most popular uh, products I've created. And so that's the package. So it would normally, this Valentine package, would normally be $164. It's for you, $88.99. Here's the number to call. 877-627-5065. 877-627-5065 for the Valentine special. Three different things you're getting. CD, DVD, and uh, rock art. All right? <clears throat> now, I said I have something else. And this something else is by itself. It's Curing the Incurable Cookbook. We do, we were out, that's why I haven't mentioned it. This always sells out. And we just got another 200 copies in. That's all we've got. This is the definitive cookbook. Vegan, gourmet vegan recipes. And I mean gourmet vegan. Yeah, I'm looking at the cover now, and it's won four of the best awards in uh, cooking as a cookbook. And in here, you also have a big chapter of people we went around the country and filmed, um, like out in California. We filmed one of the leading cardiologists um, about how he reverses all forms of heart disease using diet, plant-based diet, not even supplements. And uh, then down in Texas, a person that reverses all kinds of diseases, and up in Northern California, a person that reverses arthritis and diabetes. And so all over, we film these people, and their testimony and their patients are in here. Dean Ornich is in here, all the top. So this is by itself, just this chapter, natural approaches with protocols, how to change a diet and plant-based diet and reversing these diseases that were otherwise non-reversible. That's why we call it curing the incurable. Then you've got over, over 219 delicious gourmet vegan recipes and how to prepare them, beautifully photographed. And then you have all the juices in here you have the natural medicine cabinet, everything you need to get healthy. The best thing to put in your kitchen, and that's in here. So this is a big book. I mean, this is a huge book. What am I looking at? 544 pages. This is a huge book, beautifully done. And by the way, it was printed in the United States using vegetable dye instead of toxic ink. We planted twice the number of trees necessary to do the book. So it's a green, true green book on every level. So this is a gift to yourself. This is a gift. You can add this in. It's a separate, same phone number, a separate amount. Now, normally, this would be $50, uh, $50, and you can call that same number and get your Curing the Incurable cookbook. You can't find it anywhere. It's no bookstore, no place else to get it. Call 877 877- 627 for Curing the Incurable Cookbook. We've been out of it for the last 12 weeks. We just got it back in. Only 200 copies, however, that's it. Well, I'm told we have Luann on the line. And by the way, if anyone would like to call in now and share their views about what has happened in their life since becoming a vegan, we'd like to hear from you. Our talkback number is 888 888- 874-4888. We'd like to hear from you. And also you can go online in order, go to GaryNall.com. GaryNall.com. You know, this way you do it right away. Let's say hello to Luann Panessi. Hi, Luann. Hello, Gary. Well, if anyone wants to learn how fun and easy and delicious it is to, to live on a plant based diet. They ought to come to your retreat in Texas coming up. Um, I'm booking. I've got about 20 people a day calling me to get in, and I've got a couple of spots left. If anyone is interested in coming to the retreat, which is always just an amazing experience for people, uh, have them give me a call. My number is 903-881-7008. That's 903-881-7008. And uh, I will interview you. I interview everybody to make sure it's the right event for you. And uh, it's just, I'm always impressed with the the responses that I get from people after they've spent one or two weeks with you and all of the staff at the retreat in Texas. So uh, do give me a call. Okay, let let me put this in perspective. 
Mm-hmm. We're, we're going to be doing a retreat as a fundraiser for our sister station because they don't have enough money to pay for the premiums, though I'm told they're, you know, I've been told for a long time they're going to be sending the money. So rather than have people wait indefinitely for their premium, we are going to buy the premiums. We bought over 5,000 premiums. And so I've told the station this last time I'm going to do this, but I don't want to leave the audience hanging. And so that's why we're doing it. But at the retreat, a person can do as much or as little as they want. They can de-stress. They can relax. They can learn how to exercise. They can do yoga, meditation, large healing. They can go into the butterfly hut and have the butterflies and the, the beautiful aromatherapies and uh, the all the great features of a gorgeous place. They get counseling by you. I do lectures every day. We have great speakers. So that's the retreat. And now separate, we're going to be starting March 22nd, both at home, but also over the, uh, at the, at the, at the villa down in Texas in the mountains. We're going to be doing our second and final anti-aging confirmatory clinical study, meaning we did it and we got great results. But now we have to duplicate it to prove that it's not a fluke. And it's only when you can duplicate science that science then says, yes, you did it originally. You came up with the results. You duplicate it using the same protocol with other people administering it. And you got the same results. Therefore, it's legitimate. So that's why we're doing this. And that is different. 